100 minutes. Uh, I was not here for that meeting, so certainly let me know if there's anything that we need to talk about there, and then we'll take motions and seconds and votes from people that were here. I can make a motion to approve That'd be minutes. great. <laughs> a motion to approve minutes as presented from Monica. Is there a second? Second. Second from Cecily. Thank you. Uh, any corrections to those minutes? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nine minutes standing. And thank you for Cecily for taking care of us in my absence. Had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let it go to your head. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yes. I just want you to know how lucky you are that I'm as disciplined in terms of seconding as I am at these meetings because I was at a transportation committee meeting a few weeks ago and I don't serve on that committee. But I could not keep myself from voting on motion. <laughs> and it was, it was to the point where one of my colleagues was laughing so hard I thought she was going to weep. So, <laughs> so I, feel, I feel your pain. Oh, is that hard? Thing. Yeah, yeah. It's really hard. When I had that issue sometimes too. Well, and I bet I bet when you're the mayor, you want you're inclined to want to rule people out of order here too. Oh, uh, or move things along. <laughs> like you right now. No, I'm kidding. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not Thank you. Oh, that brings us to then our public invitation portion of the meeting. We have been taking pre-registrations for these, so people can prepare if needed. Uh, do we have any this month? I mean? Can you say that? No, there's none. So, okay. Yeah, I was distracted. <laughs> All right, then we'll move on to our uh, first information item, which will be the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund items for FY24-25. Uh, getting overviews and equity highlights from our various agency partners. Go ahead, Jessica. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start with Thank you, Chair, Commissioners, Council Member. I'm here to help present with along with the agencies the list of projects for the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund for the 24-25 biennium. So tonight you'll hear from five agencies, Washington County, Dakota County, Carver County, Blooming City of Bloomington, and Scott County. They'll be presenting their list of projects and also talking about equity highlight. And the remaining agencies will present in January 5th. Um, first, a little background on the Parks and Trails Legacy Fund. This fund was created to support parks and trails of statewide and regional significance after the passage of the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment in 2008. Um, the Council receives an appropriation each biennium for the regional park system. Excuse me. These funds are allocated to the regional parks implementing the agencies based on a formula driven by O&M shares, population, and non-local park use. The estimated funding for the next biennium is $52 million. And of this, 10% is set aside for the Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund program. So we've asked the agencies to submit a list of potential projects in preparation for the upcoming legislative session. These projects are subject to change due to final funding allocation amounts and appropriation language that authorizes the agency boards to select their projects. So they, they are allowed to change them um, after they receive their funding amounts. As part of today's presentation, we've asked the agencies to talk about their equity goals for their projects. And now I will pass it on to Washington County. Connor Schaefer is here from Washington County to talk about their projects. I always enjoy when the end of the alphabet gets to go first. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Commission. For having me today, my name is Connor Schaefer. I am a senior planner at Washington County. Excited to present on our projects for Legacy. So first is the St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park Hilltop Area Improvements. I'll be providing a highlight of that project at the next slide. Second project we have proposed is the Square Lake Park Improvements. That includes a whole host of potential things guided by a recently approved master plan, including restroom facility improvements, parking improvements, trail improvements, signage wayfinding improvements, and then boat lodge and picnic area improvements as well. And third, Point Douglas Regional Trail Facility, we've got a old and tired uh, restroom facility, beach facility on there that needs updating as well. Um, next slide. I'm excited to share a specific project with you today, and that is the St. Croix Bluffs Regional Park Hilltop Area Improvements. This area consists of two major facilities, which is that big 
picnic group shelter you see there, and then a big, large uh, playground as well. This project was identified because of group gatherings that we see rent this facility and use these two facilities uh, in, in, um, that complement each other. This area is centrally located in the park and provides amenities to, uh, to host birthday parties, family reunions, high school sports meets, and other celebrations. These facilities are important in addressing equity in our system as they are identified as highly requested amenities for underrepresented park users. We see that in the Met Council studies in addition to the master plan outreach that we do. I did reach out to our guest services staff who oversees this park or is at the contact station for this park. And she shared a really cool story from this past summer where there was a, no, a, a local nonprofit organization that um, didn't just spend a couple hours at this facility, but rented it for the entire day. They were able to go um, swimming on the beach. They played volleyball, baseball, grilled all day long. Um, it was, and they, they provided some feedback back to the staff on their way out that it was like the highlight of their entire summer. So we love making those memories at our parks and these facilities help facilitate those memories, which we really like. We also noticed that these facilities were really important during the pandemic. People were advised to avoid crowded indoor areas, uh, especially, and these large picnic shelters were safer options that people felt more comfortable to gather. Can you see that um, uh, proceeding or, or continuing to, to show up in, uh, even in 2022 as well? Uh, reservations alone, we hosted over 4,300 people the last couple of years at this, uh, this very picnic shelter, and that does not include all the people who have used it when it's not reservable, so, or when it's not reserved. So when there aren't people who reserve it, it's open and available for anyone to, to use in the public. I do want to highlight the playground as well. It's 24 years old. Uh, typically, we, uh, you know, the standard is that 15 years. Um, so we're, we're pretty late on, on, on making improvements to this. So it, it does need to be updated uh, to, meet, to meet designs and best practices for accessibility as well. Um, so we're excited to be able to take an opportunity to be, do both of those things. Uh, also, the cost to maintain these old playgrounds is also pretty burdensome, so we think that there's actually some operation maintenance savings that can happen with, it, uh, with these facilities. And finally, we'd like to explore the idea of creating a play area, not just a playground with this facility if we we're able to secure funds to fully fund this project. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Picture of the playground that's actually there, or is that a concept for what you want to build? That's existing. It's okay. the existing picture, yeah. It doesn't look 24 years old, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe I'm just getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part of it is you know, we have to go in and repaint, re screw things in, stuff like that. So we, yeah. we do try to make it stretch every year we can out of them. Yeah, it looks in a good maintenance way, but it's not trendy now. No, you right. have to go to the playground for us. <laughs> <laughs> My eye just sees, well, it's not wood, it must be new. <laughs> <laughs> oh, new is now wood. Oh, some new structures are wood now. We're going back. Yeah, we're going back. Full circle, all right. Yeah. Some of them. Yeah. Cool. Right. Mr. Chair, I, yes. I really don't want to date myself, but I'm used to metal. <laughs> <laughs> Swings and all of that kind of stuff. Slide. It was all structured out of pipes. And, you know, yeah. Like, beautiful. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Next up, we have Dakota County. Yes. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, thanks for, for having us here this afternoon. My name is Nikki Geisler, and I am the Parks Director for Dakota County. And I'm excited to share with you our request for legacy projects uh, coming up. And I'll just go through each one, and then we'll move to something very exciting on our equity highlight. So the three projects that we've identified here, uh, one is a repeat from previous years, and that is funding of our outreach coordinator. We have seen continued success reaching into uh, more corners of our community. We're truly thankful for the legacy funding to accomplish the work that our outreach coordinator is able to do. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. And just in 2022, we have been able to, uh, to facilitate and partner uh, and have and host more than 90 events and programs with community organizations that serve uh, currently underrepresented communities in our park system. So it's, um, it's really powerful work and served over 5,000 people in 2022, and we know that continuing it is, is important to our work. Our next project is uh, Fisher Ave Avenue area improvements at Spring Lake Park Reserve. This request will allow us to, to further uh, advance two signature projects, our bison reintroduction project, which I'll talk about in a minute, 
and the completion of Mississippi River Greenway. So the improvements are focused on access both to the water and to the greenway itself, trailhead, and uh, interpretation and acknowledgement of the natural and cultural resources of the park. Our third project request is, is funding for our Meesville Ravine Park Reserve Master Plan improvements. We are currently in the process of updating that master plan, and, uh, and we hope to be com completing that in 2023. Projects that could be informed by the master plan would be natural and cultural resource management, and will strive to improve access while remaining sensitive to high value uh, resources. We had the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers come out and do a traditional cultural resources study and uh, identified significant areas of the, this park that we want to protect and, um, and highlight. We'll go to the next slide here. And our, our equity highlight is uh, just a tiny little project that we, <laughs> we just have, we can't say completed. It, is, it will be a, a long time work in progress, but we're very excited that we have reintroduced American Plains Bison to Spring Lake Park Reserve. And while I'm not a natural resource expert or specialist, and I can't tell you all the benefits of reintroducing grazing as a, uh, a land management, land restoration tool, our natural resources folks could go on for a long time about how bison being a keystone species is really uh, beneficial to the land. But what I can tell you from an equity perspective is that this project has allowed for and will continue to allow for meaningful partnerships collaboration, learning uh, from our indigenous communities in, D in Dakota County. So we've been working closely with Prairie Island and the Medawakan and Sioux to help inform this project, to support it, to um, really kind of give the nod of, yes, this is the right thing to do on this land. And it gives us an opportunity to educate people about how bison uh, were eradicated from this space over 150 years ago. Uh, in an attempt to move the Dakota people out as well. So it's a, a great opportunity for us to have cultural education by reintroducing bison to this space. We're excited to do so. With that, I'll stand for any questions that you might have. All right. Questions? Um, this is a project. And you say, which zoo are you working with? Um, uh, well, I mean, we've had multiple. We've had the, the TIPOs, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, be a, a big part of uh, re the reintroduction. And then we have a, a indigenous advisory group, I don't know if that's exactly what we're calling it, that's helping us with the interpretation plan. Mm -hmm. But Prairie Island, uh, we have partnered with on uh, just kind of learning and information. We went and visited their bison herd, which is amazing. And also the Metawakip and Sioux, their upper and lower Sioux communities. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. It is. We currently, I should have said this, we have eight uh, bison right now. We're part of the Minnesota Conservation Herd, which is a partnership with the DNR, uh, Minnesota Zoo, and others. And, uh, and we have a, a hope for a max of 15. It's about 150 acres that we have paddocks, bison paddocks. Uh, we know we could probably have more, but for land restoration reasons, we want to keep it at 15 and maybe expand to another park if it goes well. Are you guys the prime movers on the bison, uh, or are the tribes? The prime we are. Yep. They, we we have have learned. You know, they they have been great in telling us how we can uh, we can move them, feed them, do all of the you know, provide water through the winter. Uh, so we've done a lot of consultation with them. But yeah. our staff, we hired a a bison technician. Yeah. Uh, she's amazing, and so she goes out there with a giant tractor and and puts them in the in the paddock she wants them by carrying corn and all sorts of stuff. That again is not familiar to me, but it's impressive to watch. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you expect to do a lot of um, tours with younger kids and go through the history and the, the animal husbandry issues of Buffalo? Yeah. Yes, Commissioner. We are um, our outdoor education program is has planned a number of programs and activities for kids, adults. We'll be looking for uh, volunteers to be kind of bison amb ambassadors that will uh, have on site kind of like our trail guides that are out monitoring our ski trails and things. They will be there to, to help visitors learn about the bison. Like we have all bison females. Rookies? What's that? Bison rookies? Yeah, we'll educate. <laughs> I, I need the education too. So we will, we will train our volunteers 
But right now we have all females, they're all cows. We aren't going to introduce a male for a couple of years. But it will be a breeding herd, eventually. Yeah. Impressive. It is, it's fun. To put that Thank 8 you. to 15 number in perspective, what, do you know the sizes of the herds at um, Sakata and Minialpa? I, I, Mr. Chair, I'm, I am, it's a great question. I'm not sure. I'd have to look. I know Prairie Island has close to 300 bison. And they can, they, you know, they're using them for, for meat. So it's different. It wasn't, it's not a land management oh. tool. So it, I think herd size can depend on what the Sure. Yeah, and the state uses. birds, of course, are much larger. Too. Yeah, Mini Alpa, I don't know what Blue Mounds is, but Mini Alpa I know started at about 11 to 15, and I was just assuming that that was that, but they've increased it, and they're, they're way more than double that now. Okay. But even 300, we're talking relatively small numbers yeah. compared to like any sort of historical thing. Okay. Anyone else? Open the gates. Yeah. And, and right. is, there any, is there any early kind of um, work that you're seeing around the interpretation and, and how that's going to roll out, not just here, but like at all the parks um, that are just in terms of what's happening with that, in terms of the relationship with the different tribes. Commissioner Taylor, can you, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. Is, is there anything right now early that you see in terms of the way that they're doing the reinterpretation or are there any, any parks that you've already started um, kind of putting new language or um, talking about um, really, the, even the natural environmental spaces. I, I feel like I've been recently in parks, and there's like this amazing work that's been done um, around the environment and water. And we, I, don't, I haven't seen anyone that's kind of done that next piece around um, the relationship with indigenous people or new narratives or any of those elements. Yes, Commissioner Taylor, it's a great question, and and we are we have a. A number of interpretive projects that are in place and, and in progress that focus on indigenous ways of being and knowing and things that in my opinion will we embrace them as we should it will make our community stronger so along our greenway our our minnesota river greenway we have uh, interpretation there we're in the process of a dakota frames project as well uh, that will happen along the minnesota greenway minnesota river greenway and at multiple parks meesville in particular, after seeing that traditional cultural properties survey and Spring Lake Park Reserve, we have mountains there and we're working on an interpretive plan. And I don't remember how much of this was actually funded and being done and how much was an uh, application to our um, equity grant program that is, may or may not have been approved, but I know you had an application related to the, the regional trail that actually goes through mm -hmm. Spring Lake Park, but also beyond the Chen to redo a bunch of signage related to exactly right Yeah, now. that's correct. Yes. So yeah, that's a good point. Anyone else? Yes, Sue. Nikki, I will never forget the first time I went to, to Spring Lake Regional mm -hmm. Park. Um, I was going for a really wonderful event, and it was hard to go indoors to the facility because I was just so awestruck by the view. And for all of us, if we get a chance to have a, a commission meeting there, I, I just, I love it. It would be great. And I'm sure the view of the bison is just as exciting. <laughs> we can hardly right. wait to make that trip. But we, thank you. We did have them on our tour schedule. During COVID? No, it was longer. Six years, five years, somewhere in there. We way. went. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It just poured out of <laughs> right it. Like right after the section of trail opened. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. And we had to have the fun of driving the bus down the bike trail. We oh, will wow. do it again because <laughs> it's worth it. And everyone wants to see the bison. I've already driven out there once yeah. and I didn't see him. I, I look for him. Well, so often you see pictures of the Mississippi and you wonder where people take those pictures from. Mm -hmm. You wish you could find that spot. That's Spring Lake Park. No. And that's Mounds Bluff. Uh, Indian Mounds Bluff, uh, the overlook here in St. Paul. Yeah. It, it, there's just nothing like it. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I would welcome any visits out there. So let's plan a, okay. a meeting and a, and a no. bison tour. Yeah. Hopefully we won't be hiding. Thank you. Keep it in mind. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Right, next, we got Carver County. All right. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Marty Walsh, Carver County Parks and Recreation Director. 
and we've got several projects here to talk a little bit about. So, um, one of our first forays into the parks and trails funding, uh, the staffing was a recreation volunteer specialist. Um, actually, the first programmer that we've had to deliver recreation programs in the county, and that leverages not only the the uh, funding from the Parks and Trails Fund, but it's also matched with our county general fund dollars. So uh, very thankful to have that position because I don't think we would have it without the, um, without the funding here. So that person is responsible for delivering a number of, I'll say hundreds of programs and reaching thousands of people. The next item there is uh, agency-wide, again, it's our Parks and Natural Resources Supervisor. It's a new position. Um, that person manages both the built and natural environment for our park area. And again, that too is the first position in that capacity. And again, leverages dollars both from the um, Parks and Trails funds as well as our general fund. So it's matched 50-50. Matched Outreach has been in, um, one of our, I'll say, areas where we've been kind of expanding in. And so it provides opportunities for, I'll say, scholarship programs for those that may not be able to afford our recreation programs. Uh, provides recreation equipment so we can have experiences in our parks that people can enjoy. So whether that's paddle boards or canoes, kayaks, and other uh, recreation pieces of equipment. And then it helps us with advertising and marketing you know, for our, our programs. So that's just some of the activities that we do with our outreach. It allows us to go to um, a number of community events so we can be staffed at the uh, city <coughs> celebrations and provide uh, information materials there as well as uh, oftentimes we will do an event. Um, an example might be such as slack mining or if we're at a lake, we might do log roll and things of that nature to engage people in their um, working and helping track activities. The program that we have um, highlighted is the uh, playground at um, Lake Minnewashta Regional Park and the Asian ability is what we're trying to, I'll say, uh, meet the equity um, highlights. Um, the picture here, you might be able to tell that just about every section on that slide has been replaced at least once. There's, two, <laughs> there's different colors there. So the playground was originally constructed in 1996. You know, it's 26 years old and it is well past due in terms of what needs to be done here. So I can highlight, you can easily see the, the changes in color there on the, on the slide. Um, we, the, it also has a wooden container, wooden retaining walls, and those two are in a rapid state of, of deterioration. So wanted to highlight that. And we know that Carver County is one of the fastest growing counties in the state. Um, youth is something that we've um, been focusing on with our growth. And that's borne out in the, the 2016 visitor study as well as the 2021 equity study. So um, we are dedicating two years of funding towards that, that project. So with that, Mr. Chair and others, I take any questions you might have. Okay. Cecily. This question is probably both for Washington County and Carver County. So in Minnesota, when you replace a playground, what do you do with the equipment? And the reason I ask is I lived in California many years and park departments would donate equipment to poorer counties or poorer regions, even in Mexico. I don't know what we do here. That's a great question. I, I, to be honest with you, I haven't replaced the playground in 20 years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, because um, some of it might still be good. Um, well, you know, yeah. I can't see the full. Mm. Yeah, and, and that would be maybe an assessment that could be done with our playground manufacturers. What we're really up against here is that the design standards have changed quite a bit, and mm -hmm. I don't know if somebody would actually take this. No, it's it's oh. safe. Mm -hmm. um, but at 26 years old, it is not something that we would, again, um, probably want to reconstruct someplace else. You just, you can't really paint this equipment. It's powder coated, mm -hmm. it chips off. When you paint it, again, the aesthetic value of that is quite a bit less than what the original uh, coating is. So, and again, with regards to how this was designed and what you can't see here is it's actually on top of a hill and there's a number of, of terraces. Whether or not it would go back the same way that was mm -hmm. deconstructed would be something else that would need to be looked at too. So, um, something for us to look into. I'm not aware of that, but <coughs> it's something that we could look into. Thank you. Anyone else? Is there any, I mean, it's interesting we have two playgrounds on our yeah. um, first 
a couple of presentations. So uh, particularly in Carver County, it's, it's actually really close to the city. Um, and so one, is there any, is there any work around um, kind of helping families that are already there begin to kind of start, you know, I won't say wilderness, but really outdoor active, either around, you know, um, between the great hiking facilities, you got a good pool, bunch of recreation. Is there any elements around that to increase those activities related to age as well? And it seems like you've identified as an underserved group based on age, and that, that's just a growth demographic because young families are looking for room, mm -hmm. and you're close. Yep. So, so if that would fall in the other bucket, if you will, with regards to our recreation and volunteer specialists. Um, and they're programming, actively programming that part for, um, with also school-aged kids, a lot of the times our summer uh, camp programs, we also have a strong relationship with School District 112. They actually bring kids out to the, out to the park area there as a part of their, um, we have a contracted service, service with them. And so those are the ways in which we are reaching those folks. The playground itself is really one way in which people um, I'll say expand their day. So they may start at the playground and end at the beach or be a part of a picnic opportunity as they're shown in Washington County. It's really a way of extending what I'll say is a day-long recreation opportunity. In terms of the school age work or some of the other things you're doing through that division, have you all had an initial conversation with um, Phyllis Wheatley from Minneapolis? And they have that camp on Oak Lake and they're planning on reopening that, I think, in 24, maybe? So they're kind of going, they're in the cut process right now. Have you had any initial conversation with them around support or? Yeah, Mr. Chair and Tony, yes, we have. Well, we've had those conversations. They, um, initially, they, they contacted Carver County and were wondering whether or not we'd be um, willing to start a pilot program there with some recreation programming and so forth. Um, that conversation, I would say, is kind of, I'll say, kind of in limbo right now. Um, they, they do, again, if they're successful with the governor's request for funding here, um, they would be funded um, to reconstruct that camp. Um, but we're quite aware, and we've had, I'll say, conversations with uh, the leadership there about where we kind of go from here. But um, they, they, are, they are focused on, on uh, I think, their mission, which is to bring inner city youth out towards um, the area of Carver County, again, where it's a little more, a, a lot more rural than um, Minneapolis, St. Paul. So, um, yeah, we've, we've continued those conversations, I guess. Other things? Okay. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Perhaps you could give a conversation. Um, <laughs> I don't have any notes on this, but um, it looks like Sorry. Bloomington is going to be remodeling a restroom and replacing a playground. So continue with the theme of playgrounds. Um, they'll be building a gender neutral bathroom facility that will be ADA compliant. I feel like we may have heard about this bathroom project. Previously, at one point. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a multi-phase project because mm -hmm. um, their appropriation is the smallest of the ten agencies. So, we'll move on to Scott County. Thanks, Jessica. Sorry to put you on the spot. It's a great presentation. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Alyssa Misfeld. I'm the strategic programs manager with Scott County Parks. I'm here to share the Scott County legacy projects. Um, so we have three. Um, the first one, the Miriam Junction Regional Trail. That's what I'm going to highlight in a bit, but it'll be creating an accessible trail connection across the Minnesota River Valley. Um, the second project is uh, maintaining what we have um, at Clear Lake Regional Park, uh, maintaining regional park and pavement infrastructure. And the third one is doing a pavilion feasibility study and working on design to support a large group gathering space within, um, within our system. But we're really excited to highlight the Merriam Junction Regional Trail today. Um, it's a really unique, um, you know, really unique recreation facility. So just to orient you geographically, this trail is designed to connect the Louisville Swamp area of the Minnesota Valley Wildlife Refuge um, to uh, across the Minnesota River Valley um, to the city of Carver. Um, so really creating a recreational feature that's going across, connecting both counties. Um, 
The project is designed to be about 2.5 miles of trail that's um, providing this really unique recreational paved multi-use experience. Um, so traditionally, a lot of there, there's a lot of recreation opportunities available within um, the Minnesota River Valley. Um, they're not, uh, most of them are natural surface and you're really getting kind of a one-sided um, experience on the River Valley, but this trail is going to be unique in that you'll be able to go from side to side and actually be um, across the River Valley. I was really excited about, uh, but not only that, this project will offer some, um, some river edge support, um, which will help support some natural and cultural resources that have been found in the area and also help with some flood stabilization. Um, the trails in this area tend to flood and this will help uh, reduce some of the flooding on the Minnesota uh, River Valley State Trail. So for this um, particular project, um, we know that it's going to be really beneficial for not only individuals in Scott County, into Carver County, and also in the region, but I really, we really wanted to highlight some of the local communities that um, are important uh, when we're thinking about this project. So within one mile of this, of this trailhead, um, about one in four individuals um, are considered low income. So considering that, that uh, you know, one mile is a, a small buffer, it's really interesting that we're providing such, um, it's really amazing that we're gonna be able to provide such a unique recreation opportunity so close to communities that um, are experiencing financial hardship. Um, I mentioned too that this um, is going to be a paved multi-use trail, that there aren't a lot of recreation opportunities um, that are that way in this particular area. And this really is filling a geographic gap um, not only just for recreation opportunities in general, but really providing that paved multi-use um, connecting both from Scott County into Carver County. And then third, um, really highlighting that this trail will help support uh, diverse ethnic communities, particularly the Hispanic and Latino populations. Um, in this area of Scott, uh, Scott County and across into Carver County, there really is a sprawling um, Hispanic population. Um, on the Scott County side, just north of this trail, um, over 50% of individuals identify as Hispanic going over onto the Carver side, you have anywhere um, on the northern side of this trail anywhere from 14 to 31% identifying as Hispanics. So this is really an interesting linkage point um, between those communities um, and is also just providing a recreation opportunity that's very close to those communities as well. Um, just a little bit about the community engagement. So this project has been planned, um, was planned in 2011, it was co-planned between Carver County and Scott County. Um, it was approved in the Scott County 2030 plan. It was then reconfirmed in the 2040 plan and the engagement that was done for the 2040 plan really focused on reaching um, some of our underserved communities, focused on doing some focus groups, some surveys, really trying to hear from you know, communities that are traditionally not heard from. And um, overwhelmingly, we heard support of not only park and trail infrastructure, but trail infrastructure that is off-road. And I can't think of a more off-road opportunity um, than this one. Um, and then uh, we also have done a lot of engagement with the, uh, with the local, um, you know, the local stakeholders. So it's a very interesting spot where there's a connection of a lot of different players at the table. You've got Carver County, Scott County, the Wildlife Refuge, um, the DNR, and also the townships. So all of them have been at the table working together um, on this project. Like I said, it was co-planned with Carver County. And then uh, moving forward upon development, we're really excited about how we can um, take what we've heard in the past, but also apply it to how do we uh, you know, how are we going to engage these communities that I mentioned that are really close to this trail for not only improving um, awareness to get them to access this trail, but also um, what are the opportunities for uh, signage, whether it's wayfinding or if it's cultural or natural interpretation signage. Um, so upon development, we're excited to do uh, more engagement specifically with the groups that are nearby that I mentioned, um, but also just to make sure that it's um, being relevant for the people in Scott County, Carver County within uh, the region. So with that, I'll take any questions. I have one. Uh, are you actually expecting to be able to complete this project with this biennium's allocation? Um, that, thank you, Mr. Chair, for that question. This um, project, I will actually defer to, so Patty Freeman is a um, general parks manager. She can speak a little bit more on the, the budget of this project. Bottom line, I'm seeing a bridge across the Minnesota River wow. and $1.7 million. It's four bridges. And actually, I'm wondering how that works. Yeah, so I, I will comment on that it is not the entirety of, of the project. <laughs> but wouldn't that be amazing if we could? I, the rest of the region would want to know how you pulled it off. Yeah. yeah so this is not, so yeah, the total cost of this is not $911,000. Um, so the construction is estimated um, at about $23 million. Previous to that, the county and the Met Council worked together and Carver County 
to acquire what had been railroad, uh, former railroad property. Okay. So we did the acquisition phase quite a while ago. Then we did master planning in our, we've, I mean, we've been trying to get this done for six years. We've done regional solicitation applications multiple times. Um, and we're, we we're, felt like there was enough momentum um, that we would be um, uh, supported either through bonding or the regional solicitation that we decided to focus some of our legacy efforts here. So we do think at the end of this month that this project is going to receive formal approval from the, would it be the TAB, is that the right yeah. acronym, um, for five and a half million. Um, we do have a little bit of federal funding. The county has earmarked eight to nine million um, local dollars. Pause, it's pretty, <laughs> Scott County. Um, yeah, that's well. And, uh, and we will be working on um, getting, we, there'll be a little gap for bond, bonding, maybe in a little gap, but there, there'll still be a, a gap there. Um, we do think we're close enough that we wanted to bring this forward with this allocation, yeah. Okay, so you are likely to be able to pull together the funding to complete it, but you're certainly not doing it for $1 million. We're not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Patty. Patty, don't go away. <laughs> uh, tell us about tell us about the bridge uh, over the, the river and the railroad status. Do we now have permission? Uh, or did, the, did the railroad bridge get torn down? Kind of railroad, refresh my thinking. Yeah, the railroad bridge went away. Um, I think we before we acquired it, we said it has to be taken down. Railroad company, whoever it was. Right. That's right. Is it a CP rail? <laughs> Uh, um, and technically speaking, the rail uh, the railway transportation board still has yeah, STB, yeah. okay service transportation board um, still has some rights as does Met Council for for sewer, um, but we have all the full rights for this to be a yeah to construct a regional trail here. So the the crossing, the main span crossing, will be a brand new bridge. Okay, yeah. And it'll be touching down in city of Carver, and they have some plans for redoing with the touchdown point, um, having a, a new park plaza and stuff. So we're um, the momentum is there, and we're we're hoping that in the next two years it, it all comes together and we can construct in twenty four. Just a follow up question: Given the low nature of that, and I see you've got some other bridges in there, do you plan on having wooden walkways in there as well as paved trail? given the flood, flooding nature of that area? Good question, Commissioner. Um, so we're using the old rail um, bed, so it is raised up, and we're adding, I forget the exact dimensions, but we are having to bring in a little bit to add to the top. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, modeling because it's in the river valley, and you know we can't yeah. be bringing in um, more fill. Um, so we are replacing um, three bridges as well as the, the main span, um, and it, the bridges are going to be concrete, so they're going to withstand flooding. And it's being built in a way that it's at an at, um, elevation that they want the water to be able to shed over it. So in a flooding situation, the trail is shut down, and then you wait and see what happened. Um, and come back and hopefully just sweep sweep, it up. sweep a little sediment aside. Um, so that's the plan. And part of the uh, $23 million is focusing on um, helping stabilize the, the edge of the river bank. So it's, it's going to go along a former river uh, or a railroad bed, is that correct? The entire length, yeah. yeah. With a, there's, um, itself and a, there's a small section that we are um, aligning right now um, based on our um, cultural, re the results of our cultural resources study. So we're having to be very careful about where um, the southern section, where the route is. They're working with that landowner and um, with our cultural resources folks. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, I know at the, um, this is a, not necessarily just a very cool question for you. And you, you, you talked about the, particularly around engagement in the Latinx community. You know, if, so we just did a project in Rogers up in that area. And so diverse Latinx communities, it's what we found once we started getting on the ground and doing work, is that there were three major trailer parks really near there. And so there was like this interesting actual concentration of poverty. It was like just like in the go in and see what's going on, right? Is what's happening here? Because there are like 
same situation, right? This is an area that we didn't want, right? Near the railroad, so on. So is there, is that diversity that you see related to that? Is that, you know, where where is that community in terms of AMI for the rest of the community? Like how does that, how does that all play out? Do you know? Kesha, are you asking specifically like how the demographics break down, uh, like in that area, yeah, like the overlap between yeah, the Hispanic community and the low-income community. Yeah, um, it's it's a good question. There is um, quite a lot of overlap in that specific area, but the um, Hispanic community does not just necessarily maybe concentrate in that uh, lower income area, but it does kind of sprawl up through into Shakopee, and like I mentioned too, it goes across the river um, when you're looking at you know not just a Scott County perspective, but into Chaska into Chanhassen. Um, and so there are varying income levels across that. Um, now, from the county, in, in, in general, there are more pockets of lower income, lower income communities in that northern section of the county. Um, there are some trailer parks that are nearby trailer home communities, but uh, that's not exclusively what's what's there. If that answers your question, okay. you know that for sure. That I mean, is that the Latinx community in that area? Are we six percent, eight percent, twelve percent, eighteen percent? Yeah, so according to the American Community Survey um, from 2015 to 2019, like I mentioned, the census tract that is on the southern end of that census tract, which ends right at our trail, it's 51% for Scott County. Then on the opposite side of the river in the Carver County side, it ranges from 14 to 31, depending on which tract you're looking at. 51? That's impressive. I know that either. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see that. Yes. Um, Chair and uh, Commissioners, we have this amazing equity, parks equity tool, and it has all that American Community Survey information in it. So you can actually look at it, and this is on the research part of the parks website on the council. Yeah, we showed it earlier. Yeah, we showed it earlier. So it's something that you can play around with, and it's really kind of, um, it's a great tool. I mean, that it's for planners, but it's for you too. If you're anything like me, I suggest setting an alarm or something so you don't realize it's Sunday four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, with that, that's, that covers it. Um, I want to thank all the agencies for being here. And are there any final questions you have for me about the Lakes program? We'll be back in January, right? Yes, we'll be back in January with the next five. Okay. All right, so that then brings us on to our other information item, which is our equity nudge for the month. Uh, talking about the transformation of Indian Mounds Regional Park with City of St. Paul. This will be something that those of you that have been here for a long time will recall some pieces of, but those that are newer will have a little backstory. So let's go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves um, for our record, and go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to kick it off. Um, Chair, Commissioners, Council Member, here you are. You're usually over there. <laughs> Just trying to confuse everyone. <laughs> good afternoon, good evening. Now, hi, my name is Tracy Kinney. I'm a Senior Planner in Parks and Community Development, and today I'm happy to facilitate this information item on Indian Mountains Regional Park. So Alan Stewart, landscape architect from the city of St. Paul, and Frankie Jackson, um, Dakota cultural resource specialist from Lower Valen Creek Project will present an update on the, of the ongoing work at the regional park. The park is 111 acres in size and located on the eastern side of downtown St. Paul, atop the bluffs of the Mississippi River. It is home to indigenous burial grounds, as well as steep slopes, rolling hills, grasslands, and woodlands. The implementation of the 2011 Long Range Plan for the park was paused as planning for a splash pad um, sparked questions about the site's impacts and appropriateness. In response to these concerns, um, St. Paul developed a cultural landscape study to, in collaboration with a consultant team, as well as extensive guidance from tribal historic uh, preservation officers. So St. Paul is planning to develop an amendment in the near future to update the Long Range Plan with the learnings from the cultural landscape study and the city's public engagement work. The intent of this information item is to build awareness and share learnings from the ongoing work. So Alan and Frankie, would you like to take it from here? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Um, as Tracy said, I'm Ellen Stewart. I'm a senior landscape architect with the Department of Parks and Recreation. And I have been um, very involved in all of this since the master plan, even I was part of that planning effort. And um, Frank Jackson is here with me. I don't know if you want to say Certainly. Something. Good afternoon, Chairman. Uh, fellow commissioners. Uh, my name is Frankie Jackson. I am the cultural resource specialist for um, the Lower Failing Creek project. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist and tribal historian by way of schooling, and I've been in cultural resource management for a little over 25 years. Um, I'm very familiar with this particular project as, as I was the compliance officer for the Prairie Island Tribal Historic Preservation Office um, for many years, but specifically when this uh, project came to light as a result of this flashback. So one of the things I like to remind people is that um, we are on Dakota land, especially when we're dealing with this particular um, park within your guys' jurisdiction. Um, this is part of what we um, consider as the Bedote, which is the creation center for us as Dakota people. And so with that in mind, um, very much like the water watercolors that you see on this diagram up here, um, there are not definite lines that kind of delineate what is sacred and what is not. And taking that into consideration um, should be the driving force um, behind how management activities are taken at this site. So, so we're here to convey both um, the plan transformation of this site and also to so the physical part of it, but also the transformation that we're trying to incite <laughs> um, in the way that people are thinking and considering this place. Um, so we're also going to be talking a little bit about the process. And as Tracy alluded to, or I guess we both, um, you both talked about the splash pad being the impetus for a lot of this work. I consider it to be the tripping point, not the tipping <laughs> point, um, that the city experienced. And it was incredibly valuable. The department, um, our collective approach shifted at that point um, in 2016 when we had our first community meeting um, for the design of this splash pad, which was part of the 2011 master plan. Um, so it was illuminating. Uh, we received a lot of opposition from Native American community, both local indigenous and then um, outstate and out of state. Uh, representatives and individuals. So the dialogue that we heard about this splash pad was um, it was it, it was uh, really uncomfortable, <laughs> incredibly challenging, and it was also incredibly eye-opening, um, which is uh, exactly what we needed to understand a little bit more about what we had thought was a very complete um, community engagement effort for the 2010 or 2011. Um, master plan. So after that meeting, uh, St. Paul Parks and Recreation stepped back and realized that we needed to have some more um, listening sessions and we wanted to discuss what our process was and the plans that we had for the site. Ultimately, as a result of that, we reallocated, we worked with, um, we worked with Met Council to reallocate the funds that were legacy funds to then instead do a cultural landscape. Um, study. Oh, and ironic, not even ironically, but at the same time, there was this, this very public, very big effort about the Dakota um, Access Pipeline and the opposition to that. So the idea of protecting water and then at the same time we're talking about putting in a splash pad <laughs> was um, remarkable. So. <laughs> um, the cultural landscape study and messaging plan um, really was, the intention of it was to educate ourselves as decision makers um, for the site. So when I say ourselves, I mean the city of St. Paul, Parks and Recreation. Um, but it was beyond just being something to give us information. We also wanted it to, um, to develop protocol in working with the indigenous communities um, about site management and the appropriateness of the different amenities. It was also a starting point to establish these relationships I have worked with Frankie very closely, um, and it has been an incredible experience. Um, and we also wanted to facilitate a public understanding of the importance of this place. Um, and so having that understanding was very important. And although 
there's not an ability to make everybody read this very important document. And if any of you have the chance, I would definitely leak through it. We have it online, so you'll be leaking through it. But um, anyway, so beyond just having this document, we need to take that a step further. But there were absolutely, I'm not doing very well in managing all of this. Um, so there were some maybe obvious and maybe not obvious challenges to doing this work and doing it well. Um, the pervasiveness of the colonial lens as agencies and um, as the community looks at arcs and looks at this space was something that we absolutely um, needed to address. And it's not something that we can just fix, but it's something that we needed to recognize and remark on. Um, there's also a long-standing mistrust or distrust of um, government by Native Americans for good reason. Um, there's also a lack of staffing and other resources in order to do this kind of work. And so we were um, working with a project budget, um, which ends. Right? Like you have it for a certain period of time and then it's over and we recognize that this is something that we need to have and facilitate and foster ongoing relationships and understandings. So the other thing is that there's a method for working together um, with the tribal communities if there is federal funding. That funding is, has got a very um, specific way that we are supposed to work government to government. But when there is funding that is not federal, there's really not any method that is prescribed for working together. And just to add to that point, um, the voices or the response that we've heard back from uh, our tribal partners, specifically the four Dakota tribes at the table, the typical method when you're dealing with agencies and tribes is to develop memorandums of understandings, um, which kind of define that uh, consultation process. Um, what we've heard from the tribes here with this particular park is they want co-management agreements versus MOAs and MOUs that spell out just simple consultation processes. So they're more interested in engaging in co-management agreements that allow them to have a little more voice at the table when it talks to the cultural sensitivity um, when managing the site. So. And so what did that result in? It resulted in a shift of thinking. When we, when we have tribal stakeholders at the table, um, we, we allow ourselves to take a look through tribal voices and tribal lenses. And part of what drove meetings going forward after this initial hiccup, if you will, um, is gearing our thought and our planning process around um, one of our most ancient and near and dear concepts as Dakota people, which is embracing the thought of mitakuye oyase, that we're all related. Everything, the seen and unseen, is related. And adopting these... Uh, um, protocols um, allowed us to go forward in a good way with our tribal stakeholders and partners at the table. So as we began to think about how to change the community's perspective on the landscape, um, which is first and foremost an indigenous place of burial, and it's been drastically um, altered over time over the last two centuries in its function as a park. Um, but how do we shift that perspective towards one that's more informed, empathetic, and respectful of the sacredness to indigenous people? Um, this is a graphic from the master plan done in 2011. Um, and it shows, you can see the red dots, I'll do the close up in a second, but um, you can see the red dots are existing mounds and the ones that you can barely see them, but they're just black outline circles. Um, those are mounds that are gone. Um, there was also, you know, there's a pavilion that was built in 1917. There was a um, sledding hill or toboggan hill in 1939. A ski jump that was constructed at one point. We've got an overlook that has been constructed. And um, there was a hotel at one point. So there have been a lot of different things on this land. Um, and if here's a close-up, a couple of different close-ups of uh, views of where the mounds were. And then you can see, if I had a pointer, I'd show you a little bit more clearly, but the, um, where it says Dayton's Bluff Cave, right to the uh, right of that are a bunch of mounds and where we now have it overlooked um, and a parking lot. Um, the airway beacon in the lower picture uh, is pointed to, and that is directly in the mound. 
And again, I think what this diagram really allows us to do is take a look at, you know, what we've heard from tribal voices. Um, it's taken a look at, you know, desecration of this site by design over the years. So as I was uh, mentioning before, the engagement for this was incredibly important because we realized that it fell short when we did the master plan, <laughs> which then produced this idea of doing a splash pad, which was um, not something that we can move forward with. So the collaborative engagement was really important with the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, um, as well as um, the community. And we have representatives of the Dakota communities on our project advisory team, as well as other stakeholders, including um, educators and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. Um, and then we also brought people together at these larger gatherings, these open houses and events, to um, have people listen to some of these conversations as well as see what the in you know what we were coming up with in terms of um, the cultural landscape study and the messaging plan that was part of that. Um, and the long range plan. Oh, I'm out of sync. The approach to <laughs> what the way is to um, to let people know what was happening and to provide something physical on the landscape more immediately than some of these longer term um, changes was to have some signage and have things that were not um, ground penetrating. We wanted to make sure that we were not doing that. Um, but just to make sure that people understand that they're in a cemetery, that this is a place where people's ancestors are buried. This is a place where people still come um, to pay respects. And so that was what we call the immediate acknowledgement plan and the installations. Um, but beyond those initial installations, we also have a longer term plan, um, which is to uh, establish a, a mound manage, management plan um, to also protect and restore the, um, the <coughs> natural resources in the area, um, prairie and savanna type landscapes, um, also renaming the site looking at providing new policy uh, for sensitive access and um, sensitive removal of existing buildings and structures, uh, trails and that kind of thing. And then also limiting um, traffic and roads. So the next step, um, steps include amending the 20, I have 2010 master plan, but I think it's because we did a lot of the work in 2010, the 2011 master plan, um, and then continue our work in transforming the park and the site. Uh, also changed the language that we refer to the park as because um, we're starting to reframe that as a place or a space and not talk about it as a park because that is definitely a colonial construct. Um, sorry to say that in this group, but <laughs> um, <laughs> you're welcome. I uh, also formalize partnerships and continue working with um, indigenous people and address ongoing decision making related to the condition and the maintenance of the site as well as modifications to the name of the site. So we don't have a specific um, process for renaming a site when it's an indigenous name. Um, upcoming conversations, I will talk a little bit more in a second, but um, we're working on <laughs> See? Um, we're working on partnerships, so thanks, Clara. Uh, and um, we'll continue to work through these partnerships with the tribal representatives, tribal nations. Um, Lower Phelan Creek project um, has been incredibly important as we do this. We're going to work with them on some more agreements, and um, Frankie has been a conduit of sorts to MIAC, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, as well as. Um, to the tribal nations at this point. Um, we need to continue having conversations with the community. Um, and then there are also regulatory things that need to happen. So Frankie can talk a little bit of, about those things. Absolutely. Um, one of the regulatory um, compliance issues that we have with this site um, falls on NAGPRA, the Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, which is a federal law. Um, uh, geared and designed to help tribes return and repatriate um, sensitive objects and human remains. Um, the interesting thing about this topic as it relates to Indian mounds is that there are still remains that came out of these mounds located right down the road at Hamlin University. There are uh, cultural material or archaeological material that was excavated from these mounds that are in um, the holding of the Minnesota Historical Society. 
So um, it's important for this commission to understand that some of the weights of these issues with regards to repatriation fall solely on the tribes to address. Um, and so early negotiations and carrying right up until present, what we've heard from our Dakota partners at the table is the thought of repatriating right at Indian Mounds Park. What that might look like, what that holds in store, um, we don't exactly know. We know that there have been past repatriation activities um, at the site that's allowed for the reinterment of some uh, objects that have come out of there in the past. Um, but again, this is a topic that we have to brace ourselves for and be ready to um, have with the tribes at the, com at the table. Um, again, this is um, uh, an important conversation to have. Um, when we look at the archaeological record for this site, it would have us believe that everything was destroyed, reconstructed, and now these are brand new mounds with nothing of cultural value or context in them. That's not how the tribes interpret this. And again, we're working to kind of break down some of those archaeological myths and untruths at the site um, and really take into consideration um, the wishes and wants for the tribal partners moving forward. This is a lot of text, but we, you know, learned a lot about including tribal communities in planning work. Um, so I'm not going to read through that, but uh, there are a lot of things that we haven't done correctly and we need to make sure that we're doing as we move forward in the planning. Does anybody have questions? Yes, yeah, Sue. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this particular site has a real personal connection for me. Um, on January 1st of 2000, uh, my husband's son and daughter-in-law asked the family and friends to meet at this site, not far from the pavilion, at 6.30 in the morning, which on January 1st of a new millennium, you know, meant getting up really early. <laughs> but it was such, a, um, such an important part of the way we started that year, to start in this beautiful location with such a rich cultural history, um, and not knowing that 10 months later we'd be looking for a cemetery location for my husband. And the reason we met there that morning was um, Bruce's oldest, son's, uh, oldest son and his wife had lost an infant baby the spring before. And they wanted to start the new year and the new millennium in a special way. And this location gave us that opportunity. And I will treasure that for as long as I live. Um, I think the number 14 is probably the most important piece of this. And I hope that the Wacom TV Center um, will seize the opportunity to help all of us, all of us learners, whether we're school-aged kids or middle-aged or old-aged <laughs> have that opportunity to learn. Uh, one of the concerns I have about diversity, equity, and inclusion is we're working really hard on the diversity and the equity, but sometimes creating the inclusion where cultures come together and learn kind of gets lost, and I think this gives us a really rich opportunity to, to do that. Um, Lower Phelan Creek has been doing great work um, I am proud to say that my niece and I help lobby for money, bonding money for the um, for the Walk on TP Center. She was, a, I think, a junior in high school or sophomore in high school at the time, and she just got so jazzed getting to do that. So um, thank you for the work you're doing. And I, I want to end with, Ellen, you talked about how this was, you know, kind of quite a wake-up call for the city of St. Paul. Um, and I'm sure there are still some bruises there, but I have to tell you there's a silver lining without a doubt, um, because the whole community learned from the city of St. Paul's experience. At least those of us who still pay attention to the newspapers and the news coverage regarding what went on. And I, it was good for all of us. And um, where the, the tribal nations find their patience in teaching and reteaching us, I don't know, but thank you. It, 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 takes, it takes a lot of that patience, so thank you. Yes. Um, Madam Vento, thank you for sharing that, that wonderful story um, of that sunrise ceremony that you guys had on that landscape. I think um, even us as indigenous people 
we're challenged at how we look and visit this landscape as well. Um, my wife, who is Dakota and has spent most of her life in the metro area, spoke about when they were young, how they would visit this as a park mm -hmm. and they would slide down the hills. Mm -hmm. And what have we learned since then? Um, we've learned a lot. Uh, and if we're paying attention, like you said, um, we should be learning and retraining our, ourselves even personally. So me as a Dakota man, how I revisit this landscape has even changed. I'm naturally trained to think park when I hear park, and that triggers a lot of, a lot of preconceived precon notions in my head. So it's challenged me as a Dakota man how I visit this landscape, how I honor the landscape, and how I promote activities going forward on the landscape. So again, Madam, I thank you for sharing that story with us, and I think we all have a personal journey on, on how we're re-envisioning this landscape, so thank you very much. Mr. Chair, if I could, I, I just have two really quick questions. Will the, the park area across the street, um, between the area where the, the, the mounds and the pavilion are and the um, Serenity um, Care Center, will that area continue as a park? Is that part of the vision, or do you intend to redef you know, redefine that as well? And then I have one Thank more. You, Commissioner, Chair. Uh, the, the vision is that, um, that's set forward in this cultural landscape study, is that it will be phased out okay. as from what you see. Okay. So there was a play area that was um, in a small spot north of this park, and it was removed because it got old, it was no longer relevant. Um, that was removed because we were putting in a new play area at Indian Mounds. And so um, now that we've done that, mm -hmm. that, will, that will remain there for as long as it um, is safe, mm -hmm. right, and in compliance. Um, but the idea is that that would be removed. Okay. Um, and, and, and the, the streets there as well? That road, road is shown in this vision as coming okay. out. Okay. The other question I have is um, the, the cemetery where Bruce is buried is um, in, in um, the north end of, well, it's right near the bike trail, the Gateway Bike Trail. Anthony knows where that is. And um, he chose it because it was near the Gateway Bike Trail. Um, he loved that, that bike trail. Um, and what's really cool about this cemetery is how diverse the cemetery is. And if our communities and neighborhoods could only be this diverse. And it, um, what I enjoy most when I go there, one of the things I enjoy most is, is seeing the diversity and seeing the way the different cultures recognize their loved ones who've died. And to the extent that, I know it sounds like a morbid subject, but the, to the extent that we can create conversations about that, I think it would be interesting in particular with this site. Um, w w will this site ever be used as a cemetery going forward? Mr. Chairman, um, Madam Vento. Um, um, call me Sue. <laughs> Sue, part of the erasure for Dakota people, and specifically when we look at this site, um, was removing us from our burial practices, uh -huh. removing us from um, our, our responsibility to memorialize our relatives the very way you see happening at, at other designated um, cemeteries. And so there, it, there has not been a designated cemetery in this metro area for Native people. There's grand conversations taking place amongst the Ojibwe and the Dakota leaders in our communities on envisioning what that might look like. Um, and so to answer your question, there's conversations happening, maybe not specifically at this park, but where in the metro area um, can land be set aside specifically for that purpose? Um, one of the things I did want to address, Sue, was um, to your point, um, one of the resounding um, messages we've heard from tribal leaders when it comes to the decommissioning of amenities at this site, being incredibly sensitive to folks who depend on these amenities within, um, uh, within this area, we've heard from tribal leaders that if something comes down, it has to be put back up somewhere else. And so if amenities are going to be taken away and slowly phased out, the tribal leaders have been adamant at identifying other locations within that same service area where those amenities can then again be offered to folks in the community. So. Cecily. I have several questions. <laughs> I'm 
I look forward to going on the website and downloading this. Um, I've, I've read cultural landscape studies, but not in a metro area, you know, where there was once a burial ground. So on one of the slides, um, upcoming conversations slide, it talks about co-management versus land back. And I'm kind of curious what co-management would look like. Is that the decision making or is that the actual hands-on maintenance type activities? Sure. <laughs> um, Madam Harris, um, to answer that question, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, land back for some tribes may not mean the transfer of title. Mm -hmm. um, what we've heard here specifically from the four Dakota tribes when it comes to managing this park um, the tribes just put forth a request to manage the burial sites alone, oh. the cleanup and maintenance of the burial sites, which we haven't had any cleanup activity in over five years in any volunteer activity for over a decade on these mounds. And so seeing that as a neglect, um, the tribes have stepped up and said, you know, um, can we work out a management plan where we are managing just the mound sites? Um, again, this was sparked because of the tribe's interest in wanting to do a volunteer cleanup of, of uh, the mounds themselves. And when we got into the nuts and bolts of what the mechanics looked like, um, uh, the tribes really didn't like the language of being called volunteers. Um, they didn't want to go through the mechanics of filling out a volunteer sheet to upkeep and, and, and uh, maintain mounds where our re relatives are. The question was put back on folks from St. Paul Park and Rec that very day standing on site and I felt sorry for them. But one of our <laughs> tribal stakeholders said, do you need a volunteer permit to go maintenance the cemetery where your relatives are buried? And so as we start to look at what these uh, formalized agreements will look like, again, land back might come in a lot of different ways and it may not be handing over titles or deeds to property and may be allowing um, tribes to have a, a say over managing small portions of this area. So that's what we see, Madam Harris, um, as a most recent request from that's our wonderful. tribal stakeholders. Thank you. So my second question is more theoretical, Emmett. And I, I'm kind of curious, you know, this tripping point that we heard about, what will trigger other cultural landscape studies within, you know, the Met Council region. I, I don't know how many places, I know there are burial mounds near me on the St. Croix River. It's on science um, museum land. But what will, I'm, I'm sure there could be a need for cultural landscape studies on locations that aren't just burial grounds. It could be ceremonial grounds, it could be spiritual of other nature type things so what you know equity became a big focus yeah. when I came on the commission four years ago so it, it's a great question <laughs> I'd almost like to put it to the, the park agencies in the audience that to, but but let me just take up um, the desire that I think the the, the sort of uh, um, implementing agency community and council have to develop relationships with the tribes and to really become more cognizant of sacred spaces uh, because I think that there is uh, a slow but but steady um, transformation of how we think about uh, spaces and, and look at areas like I, I was just listening to Scott County's presentation around the Minnesota River, and I knew that's a super sacred area for um, the Midwakanton Sioux and other Dakota tribes. And, and I know that when Scott County moves in that area, they are in communication with the tribes. I don't know the details, and, uh, but, but I know that that's, that's really the work that, that is ahead, uh, the continued um, building of relationships. So, well, and Mr. Chen, don't, Ellen and Frankie, don't you have another cultural study going on with regard to the um, Boys Totem Town? Yeah, well, Madam um, um, Bento, you're right. I think um, there are some agencies doing it right. I think look at what's happening at Dakota County. 
Um, part of what they did to initially um, kick off conversations with tribes was to do a cultural resource inventory of their property. I think if you're a land managing agency, you should have some cognizant understanding of what resources fall within your jurisdiction for management. And playing off of that, Dakota County was able to engage and start this wonderful relationship with tribal stakeholders, which takes into account um, tribal voices when it comes to managing such resources. So, um, you've got fine examples of that happening within um, okay. the park service here. All right, thank you. In a second, I will also add something because I don't know where you're going. Um, I don't either. Another thing <laughs> that I can add on that is um, there, part of we were saying other people learn from this as well. This also tied in nicely with some timing stuff for us as a commission because it was pretty close to the time that we did our last update of the parks policy plan and really started talking about the equity stuff and wondering, we want to do equity, what does that mean? This is one of the first ways we found out what does that mean. Uh, there, in conjunction with both that and an executive order that happened around a similar time frame and I think maybe some legislation things, uh, one thing that came up is anything where you're doing work or planning around things that may have indigenous sites uh, is a requirement to reach out to a state archaeological office, I think it's called, um, to find out kind of what's there and who do we talk to to find out how to deal with it. And that is something that's happened within the last 10 years. So uh, whether it's a full-on cultural study or not, uh, we have a relatively new requirement for when you start doing stuff, you got to go talk to this guy who tells you who else to go talk to to find out what we should do and what we should be thinking of and aware of. Uh, so we've seen that in our master planning stuff. All of that has relatively new consultation steps uh, starting to figure out what does that even look like because that's something we've started in my time on commission. Uh, she's up next. Yes, go ahead. No, I did lose track. <laughs> Um, oh, I was going to say that we also have learned within our agency that, you know, because all of this is very sacred landscape, especially along the river and at the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi rivers, that um, when we're looking at anything on the river, we need to be very diligent about working with the tribal store mm -hmm. preservation officers and other members of the indigenous community. But as I had said earlier, there is the challenge of not having the resources to do really intensive engagement. And so I think that has come up before for all engagement, that we're getting much more serious about the engagement that we do in general. And so the more we're doing that, the more um, resources that's taking up. So not only on, on the part of us, but the Tribal Historic Preservation Officers are, are um, tasked with working on federally funded projects, right. not projects that come from legacy funding or other things. So there's there's a big gap in and um, in the amount of work that um, they're tasked with, specific to this kind of thing, and um, what we know we need to be doing, and so that. That's a very hard thing to try to um, fill. I think Tony had his hand up before I shirk. Sure. You know, I, I was just going to say that um, I mean, it's actually great to get the most recent update because I remember when this project came through, yeah. and and I actually I think the three of us were were there, right? We were all three. Um, yeah. And I think. Um, what was actually really interesting is that everyone on Impas had the same response. It wasn't like there was no, there was nothing that said, you know what, that splash pad, great idea. Matter of fact, I was, you know, <laughs> it was like, you know, there was, and so I thought that was one. That was really like everyone on Impas was was like blown away, and that we did it actually gotten that far. That it went through what was a pseudo community engagement process. That this was an informed, right, representative decision you know to do this and um so i th and i remember that i remember we all it kind of stopped right here so I, I think for everyone for all of you that are new i mean it really is a role you know that as someone in the community you have an opportunity to really make a difference it's it's a you know it, i remember that deeply and it was super educational so that's you know so one have we done anything that actually 
um, is sharing this in a way because regionally everywhere, I mean, everywhere that we live here is that way, right? Mm -hmm. It has that mm -hmm. level of significance and this idea, and I, that document is way too big, but I do remember one. There's an idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it talks specifically about this idea of how do we move, and I think it talks about the idea of the mindset from recreation to foundational understanding of, of this all this sacred space, or you know what I mean, moving this into this idea of relation. There's like a paragraph, so that's just like the real executive summary of that. <laughs> so and do you feel like, and I, and I think pointing to Dakota County and their work, do you feel like at least in this body, from a regional part perspective, are these implementing agencies beginning to do that? Are we be, have we made that shift from, even if we're gonna go do recreation, is there a way where we're beginning to think about the places that we manage and this idea of a historical relationship, period. Because then, you know, so, so that we are reframing the narrative away from post-colonial reality to the fact that there is always a pre-colonial -pre reality, right? That is still the foundation of the relationship. And so do you feel like that is happening in terms of the work that you're doing? And then the other thing is, are you actually getting any resistance? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Um. Uh, wow, the silence here. Um, resistance, I'm going to start with that first. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> resistance, no. Um, uh, lack of understanding and need to continue educating, absolutely, at all levels, all the way up in the city. Um, and so, as we also have, um, you know, new leadership within the city will continually have to, I think, try to re-educate or educate um, administration. So I think that we have people that are on board. I think that every level of this, as we're talking about these upcoming conversations and specifically um, re-internment within the burial mounds, I think that that's something that is, um, I think that's something that's not considered park like and so I think the more community members that were involved in these conversations the more um, understanding that we were creating and you really saw the transformation of people's mindsets during that mm -hmm. which was incredible yeah. but we didn't have everybody at the table and it would be wonderful if we could and so part of what um, Frankie is doing right now is also holding more community conversations. Absolutely, Chairman. Um, community, our Commissioner Taylor, um, to your question, yes, education is something that we need to be um, promoting in terms of just a better cultural understanding of, of this landscape. Um, I left my comfortable job um, with the tribe, which I could have rode out for the last five years into retirement. I took this job at Lower Failing Creek because of these challenges that we're speaking about today. Um, because I want to be part of the active solution at the table. And to that end, um, I've been able to, um, through working at Lower Failing Creek, um, put together and identify fundings first um, to put together a series of community discussions around the landscape we're talking about. And so on the 6th, we're going to hold our first small community discussion, very targeted audience with Native Americans from um, the metro area. Um, and the title for our presentation is Archaeological Myths and Truths of Indian Mountains Park. Mm -hmm. And we hope to be able to shop that out more broadly um, in the coming months um, and maybe even provide you guys with your own presentation for that. Um, but part of what we have to do is um, beat down some of these old <laughs> historical and archaeological myths. Ah, they were giants that created these mountains. Or it was a mythical group of people that came through that left this uh, geographical footprint here. Um, so starting from square one and trying to inform not only ourselves but the general public about some of the myths and truths going on right here at Indian Mounds Park. Um, so we have a series of uh, three community engagements that we're going to hold between now and the end of February and again this is just the first meeting. So thank you sir. Just one last question for you. So in Minneapolis I know, um, you know Kelly Drummer at Nixie? There's one Youth facing group. I don't think. Yep. I, I, so, is there a St. Paul 
complement to that? I, I mean, I've just been thinking about the indigenous community and youth programming and kind of what's happening around that in Minneapolis. Is there a St. Paul complement to that? We're hoping that Lower Phelan Creek will be that hub. Okay. Um, we are hoping that we can uh, kind of replicate what's being done on the other side of the river. But um, yeah, we're hoping that Lower Phelan Creek through our youth programming, through some of the things that we have for long-term engagement, we're hoping that our organization can be the hub for that. Is that going to be St. Paul's Parks Equity Grant application next year? Sure. I'm the one at the table right now. <laughs> but thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Note to self. So, I'm trying to think of how to ask this question. If this won't ultimately be called a park, it'll be called a space or whatever the new terminology is, how can When the regional parks plan goes through its next revision, how can we have a category that covers spaces like this that are regionally interesting but aren't regionally full of trails and playgrounds and whatnot? Does that make sense? I mean, is, can there be a yeah, you're another definitely category created? Because this won't be our last time. Yeah, I don't think. you're bringing up something that was on the list in my head okay. too. <laughs> Um, as we were talking about, you know, should it be a park and then also what kind of facilities would be in it? Uh, so one, I went to, yeah, does, should there be another category within our uh, parks policy plan? A, we kind of, we have this special recreation feature thing that you could potentially slot it into that still says recreation feature, which may not be right. Special um, feature. So hold on. So then I was thinking, you know, we have a lot of things where there's cultural and historically significant spots within parks, mm -hmm. but this is maybe the only, it's the only one that comes to mind where like the whole space fits into that. And so, you know, maybe we'd need like a cultural and historic site designation. Right. Then what my mind spun off to is if that's where it goes and like we don't have recreational stuff, does this even fit within our purview in terms of statute, which talks about recreation mm -hmm. specifically? Okay. Uh, and maybe it's a, should there be, it, it is open space, but I was just trying to very quickly read some stuff and it, it's in the like purpose section, talks about open space for recreation, which is like- But yeah. you know, you can sort of split hairs. You know, yes, it's a so, passive recreation. People go pay their respects. So part of what I was thinking is, <laughs> I wonder if in addition to parks policy parks plan things, should we be having conversations about recognizing cultural and historic sites in the actual language of our statute? Uh, should that be something that we consider bringing? I know staff freaks out anytime anyone talks about touching the statutes <laughs> for Met Council. Up, like, oh you God. have your thing, I can say whatever I want without ramifications, and then Emmett later will tell me, please don't, stop talking. <laughs> I know. I'm open. But it, it, that's something we could maybe consider. I, at the state level, we have um, parks and stuff that's under the DNR, and they have the luxury of also having the right. Minnesota Historical Society so they can designate stuff on right. We don't have a counterpart to that at the regional level. And so there's several things that could potentially be talked about there, both in terms of parks policy plan and terminology there and categories there. And then also, how does that fit into our system? If it's no longer a park, should we be, are we the ones that are best suited to be responsible for it? And if so, what does that mean for us? Or is there somebody else that has better expertise and purview to handle that? I don't know. That's a whole can of worms. Yes, please. Commissioner Harris, um, there was a grand debate amongst the tribes themselves, just from the simple language that you see on the signage to call this a cemetery. There was debates amongst tribal folks and stakeholders at the table that did not want the term cemetery being used. But why we did use the term cemetery is because it's directly re, um, correlated to the, base, the state burial law. Uh -huh. um, and so cemetery is written in there as a descriptive um, definition. And so that's why you see us recognizing that as a cemetery because there's uh, a grain of teeth there for us to uh, manage that as a cemetery. And so I think if tribes and tribal stakeholders um, could have had it our way, it would not say cemetery, it may say burial grounds or something that's a little more in indicative to how we honor landscape. But again, 
taking into consideration the complexities with these westernized laws and everything we have to comply with. That's why cemetery was chosen, and it was not the popular um, decision at the table for tribal stakeholders. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I also just want to say, when I was saying, well, I think it, it's two levels, but I'm trying, and we in our department are trying very hard to use language that is um, accurate mm -hmm. and not colonial. So the idea of park being like a specific space and recreation happening in a certain way, um, I think that's kind of where I'm still tripping. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know exactly what, what's going to happen with the name of the site. And so I have a hard time. Do I call it a place? Do I call it a space? Do I call it a site? And also, what is recreation, right? Because it's, it, it is passive and mm -hmm. it can be active and it, you know, so those are they're big questions. Yeah. Well, you know what it is? And I think back to in landscape architecture school, one of my, you know, the history of landscape architecture classes you take. And it talks about in the US where recreation started. It started in the cemeteries. Mm -hmm. People, when they had free time, would stroll through the avenues, you know, in the big cemeteries in Chicago and New York and Boston. Mm -hmm. So there is kind of a connection to recreation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> it's, anyhow, I, I see Bob, but I think I also <laughs> skipped Sue earlier. So mm -hmm. that's just gonna. It's interesting. I, at the age of fifteen, I had my first behind the wheel experience in a cemetery. <laughs> it was Easter Sunday, and my dad had decided that it was time for me to drive behind the wheel. So we went out to the Catholic cemetery in my little hometown, and the back of the station wagon was filled with my siblings and a couple cousins and at one point as my dad was giving me instruction my younger brother said well at least if this doesn't go well we're close to where we're going to end up anyway <laughs> um, I would just want to give kudos to the Dayton administration which I don't know what year it was Emmett you might they um, established um, began the work of establishing a much stronger relationship with the tribal nations and one of the outcomes of that was the, the tribal, tribal um, relations training that state employees and state officials take. And as a Met Council member, one of the silver linings of the, of the uh, pandemic was that we were able to get more spaces to take that training because it was all done virtually and not in, in person. And while I deeply missed having the in-person experience, um, doing it virtually worked out fine, and um, I have a niece who is a, a junior at UMD, and she um, took her first course in the American um, Indian Division with, and I don't remember her professor's name, but she knows all about Dr. Joseph Bauerkamper and Tad Johnson, and she knows that she's supposed to be on the lookout for anything they teach as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the good things also is that this administration, the, the Walls um, Flanagan administration, has carried on that tradition and has deepened its commitment to, to making sure that whether it's dealing with park space or open space or a highway, regardless of which agency it is in the state, we're following the guidelines and we know, we know the cultural history and, the, and what needs to be done to do it right. So I just wanted to note that. Right, Bob. Mr. Chairman, five years or, or so ago, uh, when we were doing the uh, updating of the, of the 2030 plan of labor work in Texas, mm -hmm. we added in their language that encouraged us and our agencies to begin examining more fully the equity issue. And for one, I didn't exactly know what that meant or what it was going to be. But I think five years from, from then to now, we can see the value that we're seeing when plans come forward, master plans come forward, and the thinking that's going on as far as equity, inclusion, and diversity. I would say we have an opportunity now as we're working on the next update to take a look at the sensitivity to native um, issues burial issues, other sacred lands um, that we may not be aware of, but the park systems may have an opportunity to at least examine or become more aware of it because of our 
policies to say, are there any significant or any sensitive uh, native uh, lands in your proposal? Again, I don't exactly know what that means right now. I didn't exactly know what it meant five years ago when we started on the equity thing. But hearing this discussion and hearing some other discussions over the last couple of years makes me think we have a position to be able to influence it. And so I would just encourage us, as we're doing our work, to consider that. Yeah. And I think even today we've also heard um, some expanding the scope of what that kind of stuff can mean because you know, we there's a big language gap when we hear you know, sacred spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To the you know white person mind, you were like, okay, so you got like your churches and your burial sites, and that's not as broad as what kinds of things we hear referred to as sacred spaces within the indigenous context. And there's not a lot of good words to describe the kind of different categories that that can mean. Um, but in addition to just like the actual this spot of land, there's also practices and activities and things that relate to the land that can be extremely culturally important, like what we heard with the bison. It's like, there might not be anything, I don't know, there, a, a particular spot within that park may not have historically been something specific, but the idea of having bison returned to some land within our thing is a you know, significant cultural thing uh, that we've never historically been good about addressing as, you know, land relationship stuff because what the land is and what goes on the land are completely different concepts in Western white person mind. Um, so yeah, that's definitely the stuff that we're going to have to talk about in our next plan update. Anthony. Okay. I mean, is there, I mean, even is this an opportunity to notice, what's, I, you know, technically, I mean, landscape architects, I, mean, I only know this because I got issues. Um, but I think, you know, the, the technical, like for the geographers, right, you know, in the groom, wherever they are, and then radical geography emerged in the 70s, you know, where they have this very clear definition of place versus space. And I've always often thought that as the Open Space Commission, that we were never the Parks Commission. Like that it really talks, and, and the definition of this use of the word space itself always takes into account the cultural, um, historical, and, and also the environmental changes over time within a defined um, location. It's kind of how, they, how the geographers would probably talk about it, right, in yeah. terms of, um, you know, and place, I'm sorry, and the use of the word place, and how, and so is, is there something that we also do in creating these definitions and really leaning into and using them that are informed, um, really, you know, again, by a worldview that is always talking about the fact of being in the there's, there, I think you're right. I think there's things that we can do um, that would that really um, move forward in a way that we write, the way we phrase things, um, and that we add some clarity to it, and then give our, you know, our leaders and implementing agencies really the tools they need because they are, um, instead of constraints, right? Um, they're actually just kind of expanding and defining the way our imagination thinks about stuff as we go forward. Because I think we do tend to kind of think about things in a really about you've got to follow these rules. Did you? And, and we've got to also change that. That also is a shift, right? Um, where where we are um, getting people to check boxes, you know, and um, and it may be something we look because even in terms of equity work, you know, equity work turned into a box checking, right? I mean, we got it, it, and and they and there was pushback, you know, even for us working in, around spaces that we love, we wound up in, in a contentious relationship, you know, between us and the implementing agencies and leaders in those uh, spaces. And so this may be um, really you know, important for us in terms of how we can think about all of us in relationship relative to what we're trying to create in our system. And, um, and we're also setting precedent. Like I, I think there's something about how we do this. Because I actually, the, the, the co-management versus land back conversation is really interesting. Because that is really the joke. We're not giving the land back. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's going to be on your. You don't want some land back. You don't want some. Land back. <laughs> you, don't you know what I mean? It's like so. I, I just think this is also. A, this is actually a. This is if, if we can use this as a way to also begin to um, define that. Because I I think that that is really compelling for you to um, define that the way that you did. Because I know that that is a point of 
a challenge for legislators and for people yeah. from, from many municipalities and you know that it and it's always there playing in the background right um, and I think that keeps them from entering into conversation and right you know what I mean that's what I feel like we can what, do, what can we do to remove those unspoken barriers right those unspoken fears or whatever that actually keep our leaders from delving deeply into really every municipality in the state everyone who is managing land should have an active relationship with an indigenous community, right? We just we just make that a way that we're going to move forward, and um, and this project and I think the work that we're doing has an opportunity to do that. Yeah, I have a question that the full answer to it is probably several hours, but um, mm -hmm. we're just wondering kind of some basics that we can start off with. One of the things that as brought up Dayton administration kind of changing how we deal with. Indigenous tribes and best practices of government generally. There's, of course, been a lot more talk in the last you know, 10, 20 years about the nation to nation kind of things, or if we can't do that, at least state to nation. And I'm just wondering how that kind of uh, recognition of the sovereignty ties into when we're trying to do collaboration with a regional park implementing agency that's a city, county, or Park district that's obviously not the federal government. And how how does that work? And how what do people think about that kind of stuff? Uh, Commissioner, can I answer this question? Yes. Um, uh, if we look at our relatives just down the river, Prairie Island Indian community, um, two years ago they then entered into a memorandum of understanding with the city of Red Wing, which allows the tribe to take an active role on protecting cultural resources within its city jurisdiction. Um, it's a formal agreement that's out there. I can provide you guys with an example. Um, but what it does is it lays out the roadmap for collaboration and co-management of those sites. And not so much co-management, but what the tribes get an, an idea or an opportunity to do is they identify areas of sensitivity within the city's jurisdiction and whenever there's any major infrastructure um, or say you have an accident at night with a water line that's broke, there's a process in place that triggers tribal involvement, tribal participation on protecting those resources. Um, so you've got some wonderful partners within the great state of Minnesota who have taken that head on. And again, I'd, I'd ask for you guys to review um, that memorandum of understanding that's worked out between the Prairie Island Indian community and the city of Redwood. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, another example that I was thinking of um, when you're talking about co-management and more active, ongoing things instead of just kind of consultation in the plan, uh, I thought of Grand Portage State Park up north. Absolutely. Uh, which, yes, for those who may not know, is the only state park that the state does not actually own. That, In that case, it is the title to that land is owned by the tribe, and it is on a long-term lease to the state, and they very much do co-management in terms of programming and planning and things like that between the two. So this might be a slight reverse where our park implementing agencies hold the land title, but very similar kind of uh, a management agreement to that one, I would think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to your point, one of the wonderful things about that particular agreement and co-management uh, uh, agreement that's taking place there is that we heard from the tribes that this was such a neglected place over so many years um, that they wanted it closed to the public. And they closed it to the public. And that landscape is healing, and the tribal communities are working, taking small steps to reopen that back up to the public. But they're allowing the, the landscape to heal, and they're working actively to erase some of the human footprints that's been left on that, on that um, uh, I guess, that landscape. So again, there's some wonderful activities and some examples to kind of draw from. So thank you for bringing that up, Chairman. Yeah. And this is probably nothing you don't already know, but for others, one of the things that I'm constantly thinking of when I hear about stuff like that is there's this frequent idea of people hear about Native Americans in like a history class context. And it's very much a, that's the past and that's an other. And one of the parts I worry about anytime sites have to be closed off to the non-Native public is that that just perpetuates that. So like if you if you can't see it, you can't kind of get involved and have some sort of experience related to it, it's out of sight, out of mind, that doesn't exist, right? Same so trying to figure out how can and this is the same as all of our other parks are neither just 
hard surface recreation nor wilderness. It's about how do we have the mix of where people can experience it. Same kind of thing here. How can we sensitively let people in to experience it without damaging or disrespecting? Because we need that to know, you know, not only is there history here, but there's also a present. And there's, there still are Dakota people, there still are Ojibwe people, there's things going on. If, when you bring up having a new burial space, like if that did happen, would non-native people be allowed to see it, to enter it in any way, and what might that look like? And a um, similar kind of thing came up up north. There's another set of burial mounds along the Red River, right on the Canadian border. And that's something that has been closed off to the public for years, but they've been talking about, well, maybe we could have some like you know, a visitor center explain more, let people get in to learn about it, but not damage it the way they did before. Uh, so that's always a weird line that we have to try to thread so that people know that the Native people both were here and still are here, and this is why this is still important to somebody. I think some people here need to visit part of my former country, so you get the idea. I'm from Mexico to start from it. So I can tell you the best thing to do that is pride. I pride in the archaeological sites because those are my ancestors. Even when I don't look like indigenous people, part of my blood is indigenous. I come from the center, so most likely it's Azteca, which is almost gone. But I know there are Mayas and there are Mixtecas and there are Zapotecas, and they are proud of it. They still learn the language with some hard words that I will let you know how you say it, and you will never understand them because they were there. And the biggest gap is in education, in everything here. And it's to me, either flabbergasted or downfounded, because I don't know how the people here won't want to embrace really how rich is the other, you know, 2,000 or 3,000 years of history that the Native Americans know. And it will be so easy to have the kids, you know, well, this is a burial center. Like you walk in the archaeological ruins of the Mayas or in, in Mexico, I know what it means. Tourists go there and they respect it, so we know how it is. That it just I don't know. The best word will be culture or you know heritage. And I really I know this is not the right place to do it, but education is to change on that. We have to do it. I have read you know these girls' history books, and they are so bad and so wrong in so many ways that. Well, just being here had to stop me sometimes from sending angry emails. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I understand that. The other thing I can tell you, I totally, coming from Mexico, I know why you don't trust the government. We don't either. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. the truth. But um, I like to see that this work is coming, and I agree with Tony, this is open space. It belongs to this council, and we should not let it go, because most of us really care about it. So either we find a right word or not. I know English is all about words, not as much as <laughs> Spanish, although we have more. But it's just, I don't know, I mean, it's something important that we can't just let a go. And I cannot believe they really wanted to make it a park. When it's, and it's not a cemetery, I, I get those. So, but I understand that because I grew up learning all those concepts. So if we can transfer that to the younger generation, then we don't have this conversation like in a very long video now on it. It will be, yeah, it's obvious. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Dahlenberg, um, to your point, yes, I think what's taking place right here at Indian Mounds Park, especially uh, most recently with tribal participation, you guys are poised to create good change and be the leaders in transformation of landscape and how tribes interact with your agency. So I think you guys are positioned well to be game changers on this topic alone. So I want to say thank you for recognizing uh, tribal voices and thank you for valuing tribal participation. Thank you. Thank you. I do have some notes here from Commissioner Jeremy Peichel, who just wasn't able to be here tonight, but wanted to send some things. Um, so first he says, gratitude for St. Paul for their work on restoring the space and uh, their future conversation on co-management versus land return and what that looks like. Um, he does ask a question that we kind of partially got into for, we discussed starting points on that slide. I was wondering to what extent has the city and for that matter the Met Council 
worked to increase the recruitment of affiliated tribal members to work in operational planning, managing, or leadership for these lands. So I think that kind of goes beyond not only this project, but also things like this commission and your commissions and things like that. Chair, I would say that um, the city is working towards some of these uh, goals of the co-management and having um, a different kind of uh, operational setup or fabric for taking care of this site. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like, but we're working closely with um, with the tribes and through Frankie, uh, and also with um, him as uh, somebody who works for the Work and Energy Project. What else do we have more to add to that? Or... Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but again, I think having tribes and tribal stakeholders at the table to talk about what these formalized agreements look like, I think that's a terrific step in the right direction. Again, there's been an absence of tribal representation and tribal um, voices at the table. So the simple fact that we, um, we are engaged, um, I encourage us to stay engaged. And again, I'm excited to see where we're going to be with some of our stakeholders in two years. What are these agreements going to look like? How is that going to better position us to be um, responsible co-stewards of these uh, these areas? So, yeah, on that point, you uh, continues with restoration on tribal terms is good, and conservation and prevention of harm through representative leadership is even better. So, having the kind of representation be good. Uh, thank you to you and council staff for helping move forward. And Mr. Justice. Chairman, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say. What would add to that would be me seeing indigenous voices at one of these chairs here. Yeah. So I, I take the opportunity to say that. It's probably happened before. Um, we've probably had strong leadership. Um, but again, I think that's how we address some of that top down yep. issue. So thank you. Absolutely. Yes, sir. We're in the process of recruiting people. You're killing my chair report. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, You're going to be a great segue. Yes. Right on. Never mind. <laughs> Anyone else? I said I was good at not bowling, but I'm not good at keeping my mouth shut the rest of the time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? All right. I think we can wrap that up. It'll be my perfect segue then. Thank you. So yes, that, that brings us then straight to our report section of our meeting. Uh, and the first one I wanted to recognize is we do have several commissioners with terms expiring uh, in January. And some of those we have commissioners reapplying, some of them we don't. And so one thing that would be great is if people like Frankie, if he's still missing me, could reach out to some of their contacts in the districts that have these vacancies and get them to apply. So that is actually open right now for the next few weeks. Uh, so they can find that information on the Secretary of State website, or if they aren't familiar with navigating weird government bureaucracy, you can always have them reach out to myself or Emmett, and we can talk them through not only the actual process, but also what does this commission involve? What are the responsibilities, time commitments? What's it like? All that kind of stuff. If you know anybody that would be interested in one of the open districts, we would love to have those applications come through. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, and to that extent, also, I, I know some commissioners have reapplied. If you haven't, if you could let us know whether you intend to or not, that would be great. And so we know which districts we really need to go shake people down for applicants to know. Uh, we can go reaching out to various networks. Um, and oh, uh, also, of course, we had the election, and we do have continuation of our governor's administration. So that does mean that we will be able to fill those seats on a faster timeline than if the council is potentially getting replaced. So that helps our continuity a fair bit. All right, uh, any other commissioner reports? Yes, Anthony. Actually, I just want to comment. I have um, on our kind of the equity grants, and really for all the implementing agencies who received them last year, I kind of called Emmett and shared this that I've been on a number of calls or kind of different meetings where um, uh, their whatever the position was really around outreach. Um, they've come to those meetings. Um, they've been deeply engaged, like literally Washington County, Dakota County. Three Rivers Park District, I mean, you know, all of them, and, and they are doing a really great job. 
I mean, so those dollars that went from the equity grants, where they use them really around funding positions or supporting that, um, they the people in those positions have done a really striking job. So the other implementing agencies should really know that you all have done a good job because they are they have taken it very seriously. They are making sure that they're connecting to community. Um, they are spending money. You know what I mean? And, they're, and, and a lot of it is going to programmatic, programmatic innovation where there's, they've taken down strings and attachments and they're partnering in community. So it was, uh, it's actually been just over the last really 60 days and it's been really positive, so. Excellent. Any other commissioners? Yes, yes. Yeah, Washington County is continuing its same. Middle St. Croix Regional Trail just had the third TAC meeting, and it's quite a project. It's aft into the boom site just north of Stillwater, and it's ultimately going to be about 11 miles through 14 jurisdictions. And, you know, so they're still meeting with the various jurisdictions and asking them, you know, do you want Riverview? Do you want Bluff View? You know, do you want it through your downtown? Do you want it more? Um, you know, wilderness oriented. So it'll be kind of interesting what they come up with ultimately. So you can still comment. You know, it's still live on the site. Excellent. Ladies on? No? Staff? Always a couple. I just wanted to uh, continue um, Commissioner Taylor's point. And it's not me advocating, but he's saying, Sue. Get us some more money for the equity bank. <laughs> so, uh, but I have uh, just a couple. Uh, the legislative session is kicking up. Um, it's a big deal. This is a biennial budgeting session, so Parks and Trails Legacy will get funded for fiscal years 24 and 2025. Um, we have the operation and maintenance funding. Um, there's some talk of a, of a bonding bill or a cash bill. So, so um, getting you know, your voice, like legislators love to hear from people like commissioners um, about um, funding requests. So that, that was just our noise machine that always turns off at six. So <laughs> note to self, finish up. Um, but, uh, but if you need any help, Bob last time asked for some talking points for the legislative session. If anyone needs help with that, we will, we will get you some. Um, I wanted to just point out like the regional development guide, the regional parks policy plan in the in, in like Thrive 2040, now it's gonna be Thrive 2050. That work is going on. And and um, I just wanted to share out um, some of the emerging themes. It's super quick, there's three. Um, Council Member Bento, if you wanna add anything, feel free. But um, we have equity that's come floating to the top. It's certainly continuing to evolve, but that will be a big part of our next 2050 plan. Um, natural systems, there was some talk about natural resources, but I think they're landing on natural systems. And then the third one is um, uh, climate. climate, yeah, climate, <laughs> climate resilience, thank you. So like, I, I don't know how we could be better positioned to really bring the regional park system and the importance of that into that conversation, but you've helped with these conversations and so we will be. And I'd just like to add that at last night's council meeting, um, we had a special council meeting last night, we don't normally meet on the fifth Wednesday of the month, but in, in this con conversation about the 2050 plan, we talked about um, a fourth one being um, public health, safety, and well-being. And that without question connects with the national, or the um, uh, parks and open space. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, several of us made quite an argument for that, you know, being elevated and, and a part of the focus, yes, that's, especially that's, following COVID. Yes, yeah, so that whole list is pretty parks focused. Yep. Uh, my final one is um, just to say um, I really appreciated the commission saying we want to hear things that are not completely baked like we want and, and like St. Paul coming in and talking with us about um, the transformation of Indian Mounds uh, Regional Park. Um, that is that so so we really appreciate you asking for that. Um, I think St. Paul's coming back next month to talk about Summit Avenue uh, 
regional trail um, and just the, that work in progress. It's been a lively one. Um, the uh, regional development guide will be here at the next um, meeting talking about scenario planning. That's just one of the tools we use in that. Um, Southwest Regional Trail, Marty Walsh, who was here earlier, will be here uh, with Tracy carrying that one, their regional trail, Southwest Regional Trail. And um, there's one other thing, I, I printed my notes and left them on the printer, but uh, it's going to be great. Um, my final one uh, is just wishing Chi Yang a very happy birthday. I think he's been here at about since about 5:30. But Chi is our newest staff <laughs> on the Still commission and, yes. or on the, on the parks unit. But uh, he's just been a great ad, and he's now one year time with the council. But keep up oh, the I good thought work, it was Chi. his birthday. birthday. It's his birthday. No, it's his birthday. Oh, it's his birthday. birthday. Oh, it's birthday. birthday. Oh, okay. He's over a year. So. <laughs> he's over a year. Year old, but. <laughs> over here at the council. Thank you, commissioners. All right. Thank you. With that, then we're ready to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Sorry, Chief. So when you